Uh, hello, uh, welcome to the uh, one o'clock session. We're going to talk about um, education for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and I'm joined by uh, three uh, colleagues that I, I respect very, very much. Um, my colleague and very close friend, Ralph Hansen, is the past and current chair of the Department of Communication at the University of Nebraska Kearney. He's also the author of a very well respected and long running. Um, um, mass media and society textbook called Living in a Media World. Carol Zugner is chair of journalism, media, and computing at Creighton University, just down the road from UNO. Uh, she is the holder of the Joella Cohen Endowed Chair in Journalism. She and Ralph both attended the uh, 101010 uh, conference uh, when it was held here. Uh, the third panelist is Nikki B. She's an assistant professor in the UNO School of Communication here. She is in her second year teaching public relations related courses, research and things like that. She's a 2019 graduate of Bowling Green State University. And in 10, 10, 10, she was still a student. So we have uh, a really uh, well-rounded, I think, view of things. And I'd like to start by going back uh, 10 years uh, to 10, 10, 10. Um, and I'll start with Ralph. Um, what were you teaching about social media? Because you were, you, you, were, you were one of the trailblazers. I know that. What were you teaching about social media back then online um, and, and about the fairly new, and I don't use the word new media anymore because it's 30 years old. So uh, it's, it's not new in any way. It's, it's sort of getting to middle-aged media. Um, but what were you teaching about social media and what were you teaching about the new forms of journalism that were emerging? Okay, well, let me, thank you. And I, I have this terrible urge to call you uh, Mr. Peabody since we're sitting in the Wayback Machine. Um, <laughs> in the glasses. But, uh, so we'll, we'll, tell who, uh, we'll tell who is old here and who isn't. Um, back in 2010, when I was teaching uh, media literacy, I was mostly teaching in the classroom with occasional online sections. Uh, I'd been teaching online sections um, for about 10 years at that point. Um, I was still lecturing with PowerPoints along with online resources. Um, I had been grading and handling homework through uh, online management systems that dated back to me teaching a large lecture section of it at a previous university with 350 students in the class and a graduate assistant. Um, but the online class was almost all text. There was occasional link to outside video, but not a lot of video for me. It wasn't something I was comfortable with. And I had come of age with students in rural areas using uh, slow dial-up co connections. And so that I, I was very, very slow to go to um, including more uh, multimedia uh, within it. Um, it was in the summer of 2010 that I relaunched my blog that had been from uh, 2004 and had been hand coded. And it was in 2010 that I went to using a WordPress content management site that made it easy to link to things, to search things, uh, to comment on it, and really turned it from just a sort of static blog into something that was uh, quite social. Um, I had been working on the third edition of my media literacy textbook at the time. It was a black and white textbook. And the book, the paper book was clearly the main event. If there was an electronic edition, I suspect it was an unenhanced Kindle version. Uh, whereas with the eighth edition that's coming out in January, it will be on a comprehensive digital platform from Sage called Vantage, accompanied by a paper edition as an option. Um, I was on Twitter at the time, I was on Facebook at the time, but these were all relatively new things for me. Uh, Carol, I'll ask you the same question, um, but, but also I want to know, um, in, in addition, adding to that, how engaged or involved you found Creighton students to be in social media at the time, or new media? Um, well, and I just, I need to make a quick correction. I, I am no longer the department 
department chair. Uh, uh, and we are now computer science design journalists, and that's how fast things change, right? We have to keep moving things around. Um, I, uh, in 2010, I hadn't started teaching. I te started teaching a social media class in 2013, a separate class in social media. Uh, and that time, uh, students were loved Facebook, didn't know anything about Twitter, which was still relatively new at the time. Um, and um, I think some of the other platforms barely existed or didn't even exist at the time. So um, in 2010, it was more um, uh, Facebook and just making those transitions. I mean, hearing Ralph, Ralph was really on the, I think the vanguard of things that we, we have a course, um, media concepts, media literacy, media concepts, and um, we didn't call it media literacy in 2010. We uh, called it, I don't know what we called it, but it was not that class. And I think that's where we started actually putting some of these newer things in until we could start new classes and do different kinds of classes. So uh, I do think students, uh, well, I guess that's today. I won't go to 2010. And at, at that point, students were uh, using Facebook mainly to make connections and to uh, show off, in my opinion. So, I, let me let me ask this: Were you? I don't know. How, by the way, thanks for correcting me on the title because I want to get to that uh, in, okay. in 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 a minute. Right. Um, but. Um, did, did you have any trepidation about where in 2010 you, you saw journalism communication, journalism, public relations, advertising going? Uh, yes. I mean, I think since um, after 9-11 uh, after and the economic problems, um, I think uh, a trepidation about whether we could keep teaching our students in the same way that we had to start teaching them in different ways to kind of encompass so many of these different kind of skill sets that they needed to have while still emphasizing the writing and the ethics and the background that we think is so important, that things that kind of don't change in journalism. And so how you obviously, we, this is every university, how do you fit that in with uh, with the core requirements that you have. Creighton is a strong believer, as I'm sure we all are, in a strong liberal arts background. So how do you work all that into that? So I think the concern was um, uh, trying to help students um, understand that things are gonna keep changing. Things have been, been kind of the same. I always tell my students, I learned on a typewriter, right? In the same lab that they're in, I'm a graduate of Creighton. And uh, now I teach everything on a phone. And if I can do it, they can. <laughs> so, so I do think there was definitely trepidation and still trepidation about how do, we, how do we make sure students are ready for this fast changing, evolving system that we don't really know where it's going next and a, and a system that doesn't have a business model that works. So I think that's the, how do we, how do we keep, um, get students out there and a system that we need more than ever. I mean, journalism, we need good journalism. We need more than ever, right? To make sure that uh, democracy works and everything works. So how do we put all those competing things together? So. Yeah, I learned in a typewriter too. And, and <laughs> I shot film, <laughs> really <laughs> old, I shot film. Um, Nikki, you were in school and you were in school in China, I believe at the time. Yeah. What was the what was the environment in, in China? Where where was China in terms of developing and teaching um, about social media, new media? Yeah. Well, uh, I was on the other side in 2010, and I was in grad school um, a, a year after I graduated from the college in 2009. Uh, I was in the journalism side back then. And I was very eager to learn more practical skills in interviewing, um, video editing, newspaper designing, but I think it's all for the traditional media. Um, but some, like some professors in China uh, didn't incorporate many of those skills into classes and uh, they didn't make a very good connection between the theories and practice. 
but some did. Um, but we have limited resources, like uh, we don't have up to date softwares. Uh, we have uh, very few computer in the labs available for us to use, and we short of uh, the video equipment. Um, and for the social media in China uh, was just rising. And we have a platform called Zhenzhen uh, that is really close to Facebook, but it's a like college students version and um, at the beginning. And we also have another um, social media platform is called Weibo. And it's really close to Twitter and it's still very active right now. Uh, and uh, I, I went back to check um, the Facebook. I actually joined Facebook in 2010 and joined Twitter in uh, 2012. Uh, and funny is that China haven't blocked uh, Google, Facebook, uh, and the rest um, in 2010, 2012. So I have the chance to use all of them, uh, use all of the social media, but just for fun. I haven't seen any like uh, marketing values um, in 2010, and I didn't expect any skills in creating messages for uh, the newer form of media at that time. And uh, but but we use blogs a lot, and we uh, already saw the influence of those on the online media like the space. Uh, we use space uh, a lot, and we start to notice some uh, people who are more popular than others online and uh, they wrote quality content. So, uh, and later on now we give them, give them a name like influencers. So I guess um, as a student, I didn't expect much in learning any skills of using social media or writing uh, social media posts. Uh, and I haven't perceived that like uh, the online media or social media messaging is so powerful today. Yeah. Um, so Carol, I want to go back. Give me the, give me the name of, of the department again. Okay. Okay. And we just changed it and mm -hmm. we're still actually working through that. It's uh, computer science, design and journalism. And we are a computer science, there's a, a computer science program, a graphic design program and a journalism program all together. And our students and um, everyone has to take one, a basic computer science programming class, a basic design class, and a writing class, and a media literacy class. So everyone takes all of those classes. So our computer science students complain about having to write, and our journalism students complain about having to program, but then they get to internships or jobs and say, oh, I use that every day. So it's a... Right. And we're working on trying to, uh, while, while keeping each of the programs strong, trying to figure out the intersections. I, I was just going to ask what the intersection was. And if you're still trying to figure it out, where is it, where is it moving around and, and among? Right. First question. Uh, and I'll ask the second one when you answer that one. Okay. I think it's moving. I think the, the, the reason we merged with computer science about eight years ago was because the people in our graphic design, doing web design, doing mobile apps, were taking some, some computer science courses and there seemed to be great uh, synergy there. And so that's where a lot of our, uh, the students do a digital development track and uh, to be front end developers, which is more of the design part. Um, and, uh, and then also some of them also take the the, more of the computer science programming classes. Um, and so that's where a lot of our, um, a lot of it is. We have more students now we're interested in computer science and journalism. And the, my problem is I'm, the, I actually am using the Joella Cohen chair to get myself um, more up to speed on data journalism and then helping our students try and figure out those pieces. So right now it's a lot of it is in a, in a good way, computer science and design and how we can do both of those together. And we hope to do a little bit more with the journalism piece. Yeah, so that was that was gonna be my question is, although the journalism students complain about having to take a programming class, have you begun in the last few years to see more of them willing to not only take the one that's required, but go beyond any of that? Uh, yes, we see that and, we're, and we are trying to work with 
journalism students to tell them that you can't be math averse and be a journalism student. So that's the first tech, that's the first you know, barrier, right? And that you're gonna have to use data, understand data analytics. We do it in social media, we do it in the PR and advertising. So the more understanding you have, the better. So, yeah. Um, Nikki, where do you find students right now in terms of their, <clears throat> their skills? What do they know? What do they think they know? And what do you think they need to know? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think right now the technology is really shifting uh, our education. I started to teach in 2015. And um, I think there is an expectation uh, of um, learning the new technology, the social media and uh, and uh, compared to what I was a student. And I think for the current students and they think they know a lot about social media, they, because they play around with social media every day, um, multiple times, and uh, they know they how to write and they know uh, how to create a social media posts. And, um, but I think um, as the educator, I think, the series or the foundations of uh, communication may stay the same, and uh, but they don't think there is a connection between the foundations and the social media practice, and uh, and I think in order to do that, I think um, really I will uh, need to update the examples and cases when I teach, and uh, for example when I teach uh, the social media writing, and. Um, and usually in the past 10 years, we focus more on the Facebook and Twitter, but right now it's relatively old. So I probably need to uh, incorporate like Instagram or TikTok when uh, I want the student to think about the writing styles. But uh, I think sometimes they may know, they, they may think that they, they know the writing style perfectly, but it's actually it's not. Uh, there is a pattern there. Maybe like the pattern of the communication and how people write should stay similar, but there is a new elements uh, should add to those. Yeah. Ralph or Carol, anything to add to that? What they think they know, what they do know? I think that a big thing that is um, they don't they know how to use the tools you know the the basic platforms and how to speak out I don't know that they always know how to build the message that they need or how to analyze its success we're just launching our uh, social media strategies class um, this fall and uh, you know there's there's a lot of stuff going into analytics and the like that are not what they're usually thinking about in terms of social media. So I think that uh, whereas they're comfortable with the platforms in terms of using them as a tool uh, is something that some of them need to learn. Although I, I know that some of them know it quite well as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would echo what Ralph says is that I do think it's a matter of uh, the difference between using it professionally and using it personally um, that you know, professionally, that you have a strategy of goals. You look at analytics to see if you've achieved those goals. That you have to have a return on your investment in it, and you know all those kinds of things. Think, oh, because I know they all come into my social media class thinking, okay, this is going to be great. It's going to be easy. I know all about this already, and it's like, oh, we have to do that. So it's a little bit different. I also think though they like they have to analyze Instagram for an assignment, right? Oh, I'm on Instagram. It's an assignment. Don't bother me. So. So we've spent a lot of time today so far uh, talking about the main platforms, if you will, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, a little bit about TikTok, some about um, uh, LinkedIn um, and things like that. But as educators, we are faced with a new form and that's whatever your campus is using. We use Canvas, Blackboard is another platform. And uh, 
I'll say veteran educators may be struggling with, uh, with some of it, but it has made possible the ability to teach in this COVID time. And, and Ralph, you, you especially have some experience with that. Yeah, I've been teaching on uh, some sort of a content management system uh, for, I don't know, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 20 years now. Um, and uh, what's been interesting to me is seeing how our education techniques are going beyond just working with a content management system, which I'm quite comfortable with, to teaching through Zoom and having synchronous classes and uh, the like. And the fact that these are not short-term changes for us. You know, they initially were talking about, well, maybe we'll go online for a while this spring and then things will be back to normal. And right now it's not at all clear when, um, when they, what the new normal is, uh, is going to be. As I was getting ready to talk today, I was thinking about, I've been a big fan of dystopian plague stories. Um, and you know, it never occurred to me that that was going to become my reality because we have 1982, we have Frank Herbert's The White Plague where almost all women in the world die. In uh, 1992, we had P.D. James' Children of Men where there are almost no babies being born in the world. In 2012, we have Peter Heller's The Dog Stars that looks at a two-fold pandemic killing 99% of the US population. I, I shudder to think what 2022 will bring us in dystopian fiction. Uh, and yet I didn't see this coming. Um, and, uh, but of course the COVID-19 pandemic has changed everything for us. I now have a pull down green screen in my basement so that I can properly bring in a uh, synthetic, a virtual background so it doesn't look like my messy basement and I don't ghost all around like when you use a virtual background without a, without a green screen. Um, I have reflected light to give me reasonable illumination. Uh, I'm always keeping my Bluetooth headset charged. And yet I'm very, very fortunate to have that kind of facility available to me. Um, it's one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about right now is uh, Joshua Meyerowitz's 1985 book, No Sense of Place, that talked about the effect of electronic media and especially about television and how it would change how we interact. And I think his arguments apply at least as much now about our video communication. Meyerowitz argues that the very existence of electronic communication is an influence because it breaks down the uh, physical barriers that separate people uh, from each other. In the past, he said, people were limited in interacting with those with whom they could see and hear face to face. Myrowitz describes how the coming of electronic media and television in particular changed this. He said, quote, the boundaries marked by walls, doors, and barbed wire and enforced by laws, guards, and trained dogs continue to define situations by including and excluding participants. But today such boundaries function to define social situations only to the extent that information can still be restricted by restricting physical access. And I mean, this was written back in 1985 and yet it's more applicable uh, than ever now. And yet it doesn't mean that we are, you know, oh, all, Boundaries are eliminated and everybody has equal access, but um, I'm fortunate to have a properly lit space with a green screen that gives me a professional spot to speak from. I have reliable high-speed internet. I have excellent hardware, but some of my students have to do everything from a telephone, from a smartphone. They have a space that is shared with others and it may not be appropriate to share. It may not be a space that they feel comfortable uh, Sharon, they may be living in a poor multi-generational household. Uh, they can't be isolated from the inputs of pets, small children, or, sm or loud neighbors. Uh, teachers often want to insist that their students show themselves in Zoom classrooms, but it's often the case that they don't have an environment that they can share themselves with publicly. And so 
you know, there's a lot that I really like about what we're doing right now, but it's also coming at from a very privileged position that is not true for uh, all of my students. Uh, you know, uh, our chancellor, uh, Jeff Gold, Dr. Jeff Gold, uh, does a weekly program for RFD television from our, our UNO studio. So I, I get to see him about every week or every other week um, uh, when he's here. And one of his guests a month and a half or two months ago was the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, whose name escapes me, but, but, but she, was, she was his guest. And she and I were talking before the program about something, Ralph, that, that you mentioned, and, and that is the nature of access, especially in, in rural Nebraska. And, and we were talking about, you know, the, almost the need for another REA, Rural Electrification uh, Administration, to bring uh, high-speed internet to, to all areas of rural America, just as we did back in the 30s, 20s, 30s, uh, with electricity, uh, and and you know she is she's really attuned to this too, um, because and 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 the other uh, other two Carol and, and Nikki as well. Um, our students, I think, uh, Carol and Nikki, our students are a little bit different from from Ralph's uh, out in Kearney. There are a lot of rural students uh, who who attend. Um, UNK, most of the students who attend Creighton or UNO are in town, probably less so with Creighton. There are a lot of, of, of students who may not be in residence at Creighton right now, but many of the students in Omaha that go to UNO are in Omaha. Even there, high-speed internet is not guaranteed. Right. Have you found any problems that that, that has created? Right. We certainly had problems in the spring when we went right, when we kind of uh, abruptly went over spring break, went to online for the rest of the semester. And I had definitely had students who were home and did not have the same kind of internet access they would have from a dorm or being here. And it, I think it has continued or they didn't have a computer that was enough to do the kind of work that they had to do. Um, and so I think, I think those are really, Ralph's issues that he brings up are really true. I have a ring light and I don't have the green screen, but, but you know, I, I have the, these advantages in teaching that our students don't often have. And um, although many Creighton students are, are, uh, are uh, upper, upper middle class, we have a variety of students as well. And so it is hard to decide uh, what exactly the, um, the access issues are. And it's definitely something we have to think about in terms of what happens next. I mean, it's so interesting to think about what's gonna, what's gonna happen next where we're all thinking, okay, maybe next semester, but after that, we'll, we'll go back. Well, will we go back to what right. we were doing before? And now that you know, everyone has to be on, we call our Canvas system blue line. Everyone has to be on blue line. Students get used to that. They, I think some of the students get used to the Zooming, you know, they're comfortable in their apartments or their dorm rooms and they would just soon Zoom into a class. So I think it really has changed a lot of things that were, it changed the perception of things that we do um, and how we do it. Now I would like, can't wait to have students in a class without masks, without social distancing, uh, without, I have a line in my classroom where I can't go over the line. And so, you know, I can't wait for that moment, so. I have to tell you, I'm teaching uh, mass media ethics this semester, and I'm teaching it all online, and it is killing me uh, because it is an it is mostly asynchronous, and it is just killing me. I'm kind of like Jeremy. I mean, there are five or six topics a class that I could be discussing with them, and I can't. And it's just uh, this is the the worst the worst circumstance uh, in in which to uh, to teach that class. I want to get back a little bit uh, to the technology as it is, as it, not as the technology we're using to teach, although we can certainly return to that. Um, I, and I'll just throw one out. When we went to the emergency, you know, in, in the spring, we did the same thing, cut off after spring break, everything is, is online uh, from, from then on. And I had at least one student who 
lived with her grandparents who who had really basic internet service and and she could not she could not get on with this quite often so um, I'm I'm really sensitive to that, um, but I want to ask uh, uh, a question that actually came in during the last session from a student who's who's in my uh, my ethics class. How do you project the growth of social media programs and classes on college campuses in the next five to ten years? What do you see? She asked it better than I was going to. <laughs> I would. Um... William Goldman was the great screenwriter who wrote All the President's Men. He wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he wrote the one that, you know, our young people will be most likely to be familiar with, The Princess Bride. And he wrote a uh, great book about the screenwriting trade that says, nobody knows anything. Yeah. And I mean, I hate to, <laughs> I hate to come forward with that. And obviously we are going to have a growth in all these areas, but um, really in 2010, how many of us said, well, yes, we need to be prepared to be teaching through a pandemic. And you know, one of our people who were asking questions during our presentation here said, how can we possibly prepare for the future 10 years from now when we may possibly have another pandemic? And I would say, no, there's no possibly having another pandemic. Emergent diseases are part of our environment, and we need to be prepared for having emergent diseases coming out at erratic intervals, some of which will spread by air and some of which won't. But that's just part of our environment now, whether we get COVID-19 conquered or not. Um, emergent diseases are part of our life. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I think the future is really hard to predict, um, but yeah, there are always new things coming up. And uh, and because my research area stays close to social media, so I never thought about one day I won't stay on top. But interestingly that I recently started thinking that way, so how to catch the new like, media, social media platforms. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Facebook just uh, introduced Facebook campus that is specifically targets to the college students. And the funny thing is that I brought this case to class and we, we talk about uh, the catching the trend and we talk about a little bit TikTok. And one student um, in my class said, she starts to pick uh, the TikTok up because of the COVID. But at the beginning, she says she's too old to use it. So it's funny, right? They are in their early 20s. So they think they are too old to use it. So what about us? So to, to be honest, I think as the TikTok first launched, I thought it was silly. <laughs> and but um, for the research purpose, I try TikTok and then now I, I love it. And I think um, and I think um, I look at those things as the beginning. Um, I, I look at those sort of things which prejudice and because those as apps usually targets on the younger generation. And I think, and at the other day, um, I went back to check the news uh, of 4G technologies in 2010. And guess uh, what news say? They say, okay, so the future of 4G, because back then we all used 2Gs and 3Gs on network. And the future of 4G um, should be, we have better quality video calling. Okay, so this good prediction is like what we have right now. And, uh, and about the rest of the prediction is very like narrow. They only predict that, okay, we have a better, um, uh, better Wi-Fi connections and maybe quicker video uploading or page loading, but none of them talking about um, we will have a better like uh, the live video streaming and they won't predict the booming of TikTok because it won't exist if we only have 3G and 4G. So I, I think it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, and uh, it's good to think ahead uh, and prepare ahead, but, but we really don't know what happened next. I think uh, those are such great points. I also think it's so hard to predict what, whether we'll have 
will there be programs and social where there will there be will it be integrated into other classes will it be siloed in somewhere where they teach advertising social media they teach uh public relations social media and then there's social media for news is it marketing is it what is it i mean i think it's all these are what things that we have we have consistently seen as different streams chris like broadcast is here and news is here mm -hmm. well now they're not they're to, right. together they're advertising and pr i think are so much they're different and i understand that they're different but in many cases what they do is more similar than not because of social media, because of uh, user generated content, because of the way the news business is. So, uh, you know, it's really, it is really hard to predict exactly which way we're going to go and whether, uh, whether there will be uh, these huge audience social media platforms or will there be smaller audience social media platforms or ones that are I haven't been on these Clubhouse or Cameo or these other ones that are supposed to be without the problems of the big ones. So I, I just think, uh, I don't know, like and look at streaming, like media streaming, are we going to, are we going to have to pick all these different kinds of how many apps can we actually use? Which kind of gets me around, I'm not not looking far into the future. 10 years is a long ways to look into the future. All we have to do is look back 10 years and see, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we diverged. I'm not sure who said it last session. I'm not sure which of the, the two presenters, but she mentioned that in reviewing their program at her university, they found that social media classes were more oriented to how to do social media. Okay. And they've begun changing to the implications of social media. And then later in the same session, Karen Freeberg said the business school taught about metrics and measurement, but not how to. And they were getting a migration of students to come to the how to classes that her university is teaching. Where are we in terms of balance in teaching how to and the, the implications of what we're doing? I think the sort of we're sort of running into the Jurassic Park question, which is that we were so busy worrying, could we do something that we didn't ask, should we? Uh, the one topic we haven't talked at all about today that I find just enormously disturbing is uh, voice activated media, uh, the smart speakers. And there is very good evidence that these are listening to us constantly, not just when we are deliberately triggering them. And the information is being uh, gathered from them constantly about us. And if we thought, you know, that, you know, we know that our phones track where we are constantly. Um, and uh, they know what we are sending out in terms of messages, but when they can start listening into us, what are the implications uh, for that. And I just find that enormously disturbing. And I don't think we're thinking enough about that. We've always thought, oh, it's like, you know, Star Trek and you talk to the computer, but, uh, you know, you never thought about the Star, the Star Trek computer, uh, collecting, uh, data on, on us. And, uh, there's pretty good evidence that, uh, these speakers are collecting information on you during shall we say, very private times that you would not want um, Amazon or Google or Apple to have in their data set. Implications, balancing with, with technique, anything, anything more? Well, I, I mean, I definitely think that that's our, you know, our, uh, in our, in our department, we've really focused more on the creative part, which is more the writing, the producing, but mm -hmm. you have to you have to include the analytics because that's a really important part of it. So it's balancing those things out. And then um, I did start out this semester in social media by saying, okay, these platforms are all you know like a like that everything is fine meme. You know, it's like they're burning around us all these problems with them. Uh, everyone tells you to get off of them. Why should we be on these platforms? What do they What do they bring to us? And so um, it is this big, uh, 
trying to balance that. What are the implications? What are the problems? I mean, Ralph brings up great points about the voice activated things. Part, partly I talked about what are we willing to give up because it's convenient um, and it makes our lives easier. So if we can um, you know, have someone turn on music for us, do we not care if they're listening to us other times? And so I think these are all questions that we really need to make sure that are in our classes in some way. Um, and certainly, you know, if I'm talking to students about how you do advertising on social media to talk about how you could take that too far, the targeting advertising and how that has led to problems. And so um, we have to, I do think we have to link it in our classes. Uh, very hard this semester, certainly, because we all have shortened semesters because of the pandemic, but um, to work to try and do that. The, the genie will never be put back in the bottle. The genie of social right. media will, right. will never be put back into the bottle. But I do know people that are deleting Facebook right. and Twitter and some of those things because of the, Jeremy showed a, a, a trailer for a, a, a documentary. I mean, there are several out there that, that enumerate the dangers right. beyond what Ralph talked about with the voice activated, which is scary enough and I had heard about. Um, what are the what are the I, I hate to use the word implication again, but 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 you know what what does that forebode as far as legacy media um, and and the forms uh, that some people have found uh, using social media for journalism? Well, I, I mean, I think we have to be more uh, journalism. We have to be more entrepreneurial in how we do things and that we have to uh, keep the, I mean, I love news organizations, you know, legacy media news organizations uh, for the most part, sometimes they drive me crazy. But we have to, uh, I, I am concerned about if people start, they are paying attention to legacy media and they aren't on social media, how do we, uh, how do we build community? How do we get important information to people? How do we help people understand how the world works and their place in it? I, I am actually, that's a concern I have about telling people to get off of social media and my students who, I mean, ten, my students tend to use social more to communicate with each other. You know, they don't really use it to yeah. look for ideas. And I think Gina Lutrella in the last session talked about her, her this uses a personal learning network. How do I, and that's how I use it too, to, I can find out about so many different things. I can, I can see on Twitter what Ralph is blogging about and I can see what Jeremy's thinking. I can learn all sorts of things that I just wouldn't have time or energy to do in another place. And that's what I fear that we lose if people, if people just decide they're gonna get off social media altogether or the audiences drop. Um, how, do we, how do we have a, uh, a society that has linked concerns and linked understanding. Um, go ahead, Ralph, you were gonna. I was just gonna say, I'm not sure that, you know, I know that legacy media still matters in terms of having substantial news organizations, but I think that our legacy media are increasingly becoming uh, more and more a part of our social media. If you look at right. the you know, our big three newspapers yeah. in the US, the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, uh, they all exist far more as online properties than as black ink on white paper uh, properties. And their plan is to, you know, probably eventually, you know, in the not so distant future, uh, discontinue the, the paper yeah. product, but still very definitely be a paid premium product. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of you. I, I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning. Uh, my name is Chris Allen, for those who can't see the little, little slide. I'm a professor in the School of Communication, and I also am general manager of UNO Television and KVNO Radio, two legacy media types, uh, and still trying to learn how to teach in, in the, uh, the, the brave new present. Um, so thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, Ralph and to Carol and to Nikki. Uh, and thanks, Jeremy, for uh, for inviting me to uh, to participate and uh, to have a panel. By the way, this is my messy office. It's not even a basement. And and I decided one day I was recording a lecture for for Canvas, and I decided that in order to distract my students, I would actually point out what they were looking at behind me. <laughs> I took them on a tour of my office uh, 